Do you ever wonder, how will I know if my emotionally unavailable oh. partner really loves me? If so, you are in the right place. Because by the end of this video, you will know the six signs that an avoidant partner loves you. To begin, I'd like to tell you about Kara. Kara is a cisgender woman in a heterosexual relationship with Tim, whom she describes as emotionally unavailable. And that's because Tim tends to run hot and cold. One minute he's all cuddly and lovey-dovey, full of hand-holding and future talking. And then the next minute it takes him up to 48 hours to respond to a text with no more than three words at that with no emojis. Tim seems to like her and he is flirty and receptive when they are together, but there's this undercurrent of conflict that he seems to carry around it. The attraction is intense and Kara can feel that the sexual chemistry is probably amazing, but Tim always seems to pump the brakes and say that he wants to take things slow. Overall, it seems like he's really into her, but then he gets tongue-tied when she asks for clarity around the status of their relationship. What is Tim's deal? Kara can tell he does care about her to some degree, but the biggest question she has is, how much? So let's dive into our six signs so we can take Kara from confused to clear about the status of her situationship. But before we do that, if you are new to my channel, welcome. My name is Brianna McWilliam and I am a licensed and board certified creative arts therapist with more than 15 years in the field, helping adults struggling with insecure attachment go from self-doubting to self-sovereign so they can attract the soul-shaking passionate partnerships that they want. And I do this using a psycho-spiritual approach to creative arts interventions, which I call the McWilliam Method. The content on my YouTube channel is derived from my online courses, which you can learn more about through the link in the caption of this video. If you would like to learn more about your attachment style, you can take the four question quiz. If you like what you see in here and you want to learn more, make sure you like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications. I put up videos once a week and I wouldn't want you to miss out. To start us off, let's do a little quick recap of avoidant attachment from our last video, Six Reasons Avoidant Partners Pull Away and Why. Avoidant partners, whom I refer to as rolling stones, tend to be emotionally unavailable and put distance between themselves and a partner. They are likely to be taught that talking about feelings was burdensome or at the very least led to super awkward conversations. As a result, they usually struggle to understand how they feel about something or someone on a deeper level and therefore are confused about what they really want and or how to articulate it. Additionally, avoidance tends to present itself in one of two ways, and that is fearful avoidance and dismissive avoidance. If you'd like to learn more about the differences between fearful avoidance and dismissive avoidance, I invite you to check out my video on the topic. Two types of emotional unavailability, fearful avoidance versus dismissive avoidance. There will also be a downloadable checklist and assessment in the caption of that video. Now, just because your partner may struggle with emotional intimacy doesn't mean that true loving feelings aren't there or that they don't deserve a little compassion and patience while they take some time to figure it out. If you're at your wit's end, however, here are six signs that your emotionally unavailable partner most likely is into you, or at the very least is getting there. Number one, they break their own rules. To protect their sense of freedom and autonomy, most Rolling Stones will have both spoken and unspoken rules about how much time they will allow themselves to spend with a romantic partner. Now, if they love you or they're falling in love with you, they will start breaking those rules, whether you are aware of it or not and they are likely to exhibit some kind of internal conflict over it. For example, when Anne met her husband, Mark, he told her that he used to only see people he was dating once a week, claiming that he had too much work to do otherwise. When he had started dating Anne, however, he spent most of his free time with her, according to Anne's availability, because she was a single mother. Mark didn't share this rule that he had previously with Anne until Anne started questioning his feelings for her. Mark shared this information with Anne because he was trying to prove to her how much he loved her when Anne was struggling to see the signs. Number two, they prefer to take things slow. Rolling stones can have a habit of being hyper or hyposexual. Hypersexuality looks like drawing severe lines between sexual partners and emotionally intimate ones. And those lines rarely, if ever, cross. Hyposexual partners can feel violated or overstimulated by sexual contact. And this is usually due to past traumas. So they are a lot slower to open up physically. If you have a partner that you know to be more hypersexual in their dating history and they are hands off with you, 
but have not friend zoned you yet, take that as a good sign. You haven't been dumped in the good for only one thing category. If you sense that your partner is more hyposexual and they indicate that they do have a sexual interest and attraction to you, but they just need more time, even if it feels like it's going at a snail's pace, know that this is actually a tremendous show of interest and investment from them on their part because they aren't gonna make that kind of effort for just anybody. Number three, they leave you alone in their private spaces. Rolling Stones are incredibly private and maybe a little bit paranoid. And it's not always because they're hiding something, usually it's just the principle of the thing. This is my space and that is yours. If they perceive you as trying to invade or snoop around in their private spaces, they will take that as a form of disrespect or that you don't trust them. And if that's the case, they will deduce that they could never feel fully themselves or free enough in relationship with you. And so if a Rolling Stone partner lets you stay over their place and then leaves you alone in the apartment without locking up their phone, I would bet that they are smitten with you and or they're also testing you. My advice is to avoid touching anything and to get out of there as soon as possible so that you can avoid any temptation to snoop. Trust me, you will be much better off. Now here, I'd just like to pause and ask, does any of this sound familiar? Has your partner been breaking their own rules for you? Have they expressed a desire to take things slow? Or have they demonstrated a growing trust in you by inviting them into their private spaces? I'd love to know in the comments below and or just give me a like and thumbs up. That lets me know we're on the right track and we can make more content like this. Also remember to subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. I put out videos once a week and I wouldn't want you to miss out. So let's continue with number four. They agree to make travel plans with you. There is nothing scarier for a Rolling Stone than being trapped in an unknown place with nowhere to hide and nowhere to escape to. If a Rolling Stone agrees to travel with you and only you, not with a whole big group of friends, and more than that makes an effort to participate in the travel planning, they are very serious about you. They are also going to be scrutinizing your every word and move on this trip because it is one of the biggest tests that they have for long-term compatibility. Before making any assumptions, I would find out what kind of a traveler they are before getting on a plane, train, or automobile, so you can feel like you are on shore footing. Number five, they introduce you to their family or their kids. Rolling Stones are hesitant to introduce you to their family typically for one of two reasons. Number one, they don't actually see themselves in a long-term relationship with you. Or number two, they're afraid their family is going to drive you off. If they really dig you, they will get over the fear of their family driving you off because they will realize that in order to keep you, they will have to invite you to at least one family dinner per year. But be forewarned, it's likely that an argument will ensue after this special occasion because it will have been a tense and important situation for them. But if you can ride it out and they can witness your steadfastness, that pressure will decrease over time. Number six has to do with love languages. In particular, acts of service, physical touch, and gift giving. For this sign, I am referencing Gary Chapman's five love languages. When I ask avoidant rolling stones in my online community about which of the five love languages do they most identify with, overwhelmingly they report first through acts of service, followed by sexual and or physical contact, after that, it is gift giving and then quality time. Words of affirmation were at the bottom of the list if it had any kind of mention at all. Words are typically hard for Rolling Stones to access, particularly words that express feelings and emotions. Plus, many Rolling Stones view words as cheap. It's likely that in their experience, caregivers did not utter very kind words. They probably did not keep their word or follow through on any empty promises. So if you want to know if a Rolling Stone loves you, pay attention to what they do for you and how much they take you into consideration when they make decisions for themselves in their lives. For example, do they imagine you doing things together in the future? Do they prioritize you above their job? Do they make plans with you and make sure to set a date and time? Do they press their leg against yours while you're watching Netflix on TV? Do they get over their cuddle phobia long enough to hold you for at least 30 minutes before bedtime? Do they surprise you with unexpected but thoughtful small gifts? 
If so, then I'd bet you mean more to them than you realize. Now, almost always when I share these signs with a partner, particularly an anxious one, the following question is, okay, great. Now I know they like me. Now, how do I act so that I know they'll stick around? Here's the fundamental problem with that question. When you have a Rolling Stone who is emotionally unavailable and they place a high value on personal freedom and emotional spaciousness in a relationship, while you place a high value on connectedness and emotional closeness in a relationship, it's likely you're gonna feel like you always want more than they do, which means you are likely to always fall into a habit of moving towards them and orienting yourself to what they want in all things. This gives them disproportionate responsibility and power over you and your happiness, which happens to be the last thing that they want because they feel it ties them down. So if you heard this list and you think that your avoidant partner might actually love you, it means you're at a critical juncture in your relationship. If you get overexcited and decide that you want to accelerate your process by people pleasing or somehow making it easier for them to commit faster, that is the fast track to self-abandonment and losing yourself in this relationship even to the point where you don't know who you are without them. In addition to that, there will likely be a layer of anger and resentment for feeling like you always have to chase them down and you never get what you want and need. More simply, we might call this a codependent question, and that is likely because your attachment system is lit up telling you that this specific person is your best and only route to happiness, and you have to mold yourself to suit their desires or be abandoned and thus devalued having missed out on your predestined and divine opportunity for lifelong love and happiness. So I would here like to offer a few questions that you should be asking instead. These questions are intended to help you assume a position of what I call self-sovereignty so you can approach the viability of this relationship from a position of power and self-possession. You want to honor what you want and need in a relationship and stand steadfast in that so you attract a match to what you want, rather than try to anxiously fill up the space and always be chasing your partner down. Because the thing is, if you never give them the time and space to move towards you, to try to meet you where you're at, you'll never really know if they are a compatible match or not. So now I'd have you start asking questions like, okay, great, they like me, now I know. Now I'd like to pay attention to if they have a real sense of purpose in their life, and or if that sense of purpose is a good match and jives with my sense of purpose. Do we have similar long-term goals and can I see myself happy in the future with this person? Do I feel safe speaking my mind around this person or do I clam up and bite down my tongue because I'm afraid of how they might react to something I say? Are they generous of spirit and volunteer to help me with things just out of the kindness of their heart? not because they're holding a scoreboard above the relationship and no good deed goes unpunished. Do our cultural and moral values align and do we each equally prioritize those things in our daily life and routines? Can they stay on topic during an argument without hitting below the belt or degrading my character? And how do they repair after a conflict? Can they come back and address the issue directly? Or do they pretend like it never happened and expect me to do the same? Do they communicate in an honest and direct manner? Or does it sometimes feel like they're speaking in code and I'm expected to read between the lines? Are they able to find co-creative solutions when problems arise in the relationship? Or do they cut me out or accuse me of being more demanding than I actually am? Now, if your answers to these questions are mostly negative, then you really need to dig into Why are you pursuing this relationship anyway? It's likely that you would find a lot of subconscious limiting beliefs fueled by fear and facilitated by a stimulated attachment system that insists this person is your best and only opportunity for love. If your answers are primarily positive to these questions, or at least they fall within the vicinity of satisfying how you would like your partner to show up in these dimensions, then I would say don't change a thing. Just keep doing what you're doing. As time goes on, the relationship will naturally unfold and new situations will present themselves to you that will give you another opportunity to assess your partner and their compatibility long-term. Now, if you want to know more specific details, however, about what makes an emotionally unavailable partner want to be a better man, 
as opposed to break up with you because you're just too good for them. Remember to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications. Because next week we are going to talk about the six surprising traits that make emotionally unavailable partners fall in love. Now, if you've come this far and you feel like your partner tends to pull away, more than they exhibit any of these six signs. I recommend watching the first video in this series, Six Reasons Avoiding Partners Pull Away and Why. Also remember to give me a like and a comment so that I know you like this content and you'd like to see more. And lastly, if you'd like to know more about your attachment style or the attachment style of your partners, you can click on the link in the caption of this video to take an easy four question quiz. Thank you for watching and I will see you next week.